Hello! In the first example program for Chapter 7, we tested the GPIO ports configured as outputs. Now in the third video, let's see an example for the input port. The simplest input device is thought to be the push button, but here's why it's not so simple. When we want to recognize a button press with the microcontroller, unexpected things can happen. For example, our controller can detect several presses of the button. It is legitimate to ask, how is that? We only press the button once, so what exactly happens? Let's start at the beginning. Suppose you have an ideal push button. Unfortunately, in reality, there is no such thing. The ideal no, normally open push button, closes its contacts immediately when pressed and opens them immediately when released. The switches and push buttons available in reality are made of mechanical parts with flexible metal components. Therefore, when switching, the contacts vibrate. The switch oscillates between the open and closed state after the switchover, even for a few milliseconds. This phenomenon is called a prelling. We don't notice this in everyday life, but the controller can perform thousands of operations in a few milliseconds. In engineering practice, this is a problem. For example, when we want to use a microcontroller to test a leading edge or trailing edge. You can see that pressing a button will produce several edges. This figure shows the detection of a leading edge when a button is pressed. It is advisable to avoid the disturbance caused by prelling by using a hardware or software debounce. Adding a resistor, the R2, and the capacitor, the C1, to the push button, as shown in this figure, will absorb the pulses generated during the prel. A really nice solution is to add the RC circuit to the Schmidt trigger. The STM32 microcontroller we are using has a built-in Schmidt trigger, as explained in the input mode section. If a controller does not include a Schmidt trigger, it should be incorporated into the circuit as an external discrete component. The RC filtered signal is monitored with a Schmidt trigger. By operating the switch, the capacitor is charged through the resistor. Against fast voltage changes, in case of high frequency, the capacitor acts as a short circuit to ground, dissipates or suppresses them, while against slow changes, with low frequency signals, it acts as a discontinuity passing them through to the output of the RC filter. An interesting feature of the Schmidt trigger is that it tips down at a lower voltage level and tips up at a higher voltage level, so it acts like a hysteresis comparator, so it does not compare to a given voltage value, but to the lower and upper limits of a voltage range. As we have mentioned before, chapter 14 of the Historic Electronics 1 curriculum explains in detail how Schmidt triggers work. The RC filter must be sized so that the switch's ripple cannot generate larger pikes than the hysteresis of the Schmidt trigger. This ensures ripple-free operation. If you have to handle a lot of inputs, the components make the connection very complicated and take up a lot of space. In such cases, it is better to choose another way software-based debouncing. It is important to note, however, that when many inputs are handled independently, software debouncing is also resource-intensive. Therefore, we should always consider what the most cost-effective solution is. If you have a lot of switches and you switch them relatively infrequently, it is better to go the software route. If the switches are frequently switched, it is better to go for a hardware solution. In the following example, we show an option for software debouncing. The essence of software debounce is that physically the prel occurs, but we intentionally only consider the switchover once during the assumed switchover time. Let's modify and extend the previous example to implement a 4-bit binary counter with LEDs. We have already made the appropriate changes. All you have to do is open the Lecture 7 BTM project for this chapter and the main.c file inside.
First, we choose a threshold value, the maximum value we think or have experimented with, after which no more periods will occur. This will be debouncing threshold value, which is 250 in our case. We also need two variables to store the state of the push button. One is used to store the previous state of the button, in the previous state debounce variable, and in the other one, we store the current state, the current state debounce variable. We need to store the number of states equal to the previous one in consecutive periods. This is stored in the count debounce variable. Furthermore, the transition between the falling and rising edges must be detected with the previous state edge variable. Monitor the status of the button and wait until it is stable, that is, it does not change its value. It is also important to check whether the states taken as stable, now 250 pieces, are consecutive. If the current and previous states are equal, increment the counter. If different, reset it. If the counter reaches the maximum value, we can be sure that the prel has finished and the button has reached a stable state. If we did not check, or if we chose a small number of states to be stable, we would sometimes experience malfunctioning. It may be the case that we would mistake the permutations between stable states as switching. Once we are sure that the switch is stable, we check if there has been a switchover or edge detection. If so, we step the counter. So let's see if the example program really works as we would expect. I will upload the program to the microcontroller in a moment. This will take a few moments. I think we've successfully uploaded the code. When I press this push button, what I see is that it's counting up nicely in binary with the LEDs. So it works as you would expect. However, I'm still wondering what happens if I set this debouncing threshold to low, so we don't wait so long after the first live detection. Well, let's see the effect of the prel. Perhaps we will see a change, yes. Okay, in theory the modified code is up. I'll press it once. One led, two leads. And here you could see it. I pressed the button once, and the LEDs counted too. Now a similar event has happened. So you can see that the prel significantly changes the accuracy of our program running. That's right. And that's all there is to it. If you want to experiment, you can combine the input and output ports. There are plenty of them on the microcontroller, and you can use them as you like. The example program is always a good starting point for a new project. We almost always need I.O. ports. Chapter 7 also includes a video in which we will talk about the relationship between the analog and digital worlds. Join us there too. See you. Bye.